Welcome to our first video on off amps. In this video, we will have a look at ideal op amp modeling, the basics for deriving a transfer function around op amp, and the properties of applying negative feedback to operational amplifier. So, first off, our op amp has a symbol showing a inverting and non inverting input. So, the inverting is this one, and the non inverting is VP. We have output to our amplifier. So these two are the inputs that will be subtracted and multiplied with a gain, providing our output. Op-amp also has power rails, VCC and VDD. That is a positive rail. VCC if it's a bipolar op-amp and VDD if it's MOSFET based. Same VEE and VSS, this is either the negative rail or where you will add a ground if it's a single rail op-amp. So the model for the op-amp is it needs to take a voltage in so it is dissipated over a resistor and provide a voltage out and according to Thevenin, there should be a resistor in series with our dependent voltage source. So, dependent voltage source is our voltage gain. Z in is our input impedance and Z out is our output impedance for our model. And for ideal op amp, the output impedance should be equal to zero. This means that there is no losses when we're powering a device external to our amplifier. And our input impedance should be infinite. So there is no losses going into our device. We will have maximum power transfer in and out of our amplifier. The gain for ideal op amp is infinite. So that we don't have to worry about anything. When we are deriving a transfer function around our amplifier, we always know that we have enough gain available to achieve our goals when applying feedback. This is not always the case, especially for practical op amps. The ideal op amp is to help us to derive equations and to design but when you're applying practical components you need to start to think about more aspects of an op amp okay the bandwidth of this op amp if we're assuming it's ideal is also infinite so we don't worry about the frequency model when we talk about the ideal op amp also the output voltage is our gain and the non-inverting subtract the inverting gives our output voltage. So with our op amp being ideal, Z in is an open circuit. So no currents can be flowing into our op amp. Okay, so IP and IN we assume to be zero for ideal and the op amp try to force VP and VN to be the same. So the assumption is that they are the same when we are dealing with ideal op amp and we have no losses going out of our op amp. Z out is assumed to be a short circuit. So when you need to derive an equation after applying negative feedback to an amplifier like this, you assume that the currents going in is zero. We assume that the two voltages is the same and for the rest we can just use Kirchhoff's current, Kirchhoff's voltage and Ohm's law. Now 
in the next slide we're going to take a look at the properties of negative feedback. So when dealing with amplifiers we always apply the feedback on the inverting terminal. This is so that our system does not become unstable or is driven into saturation. So we have a very large output voltage and a portion of it is subtracted to stabilize our output. So for amplifiers, the feedback will always be negative. Positive feedback will only be used when we start to deal with oscillators and or Schmidt triggers. So amplification feedback always on the negative terminal of this op amp. Okay, so what is the properties of adding negative feedback to an amplifier of any sort? Not necessarily just op amps, we can connect the op amp in a lot of configurations with feedback. So the typical one is the voltage amplifier. And for a voltage to be transferred into and out of amplifier, we need our input impedance to be infinite so that maximum voltage can go in and our output should be zero so that maximum voltage can be given out. So negative feedback should increase our input impedance and decrease our output impedance. Okay, so the first column here tells us what will happen and the second one tells us what the ideal case should be. Okay, current amplifiers. So for currents, looking at a Norton model, a current source has infinite impedance in parallel with itself. So for output, we need a infinite amount of impedance available and at the input we should have zero. Current follows the path of least resistance. So if we want current to flow into amplifier, our input impedance needs to be zero. So the input for a current amplifier will be decreased and the output should be increased. Same for a transconductance amplifier. It provides amps out or current out and takes a voltage in so that both input and output should increase. Transresistance amplifier gives a voltage out, takes a current in, so both should be very low, so both should decrease. Okay, so always keep this in mind when doing amplifiers. This is also useful to remember if you're ever doing proper feedback theory. Okay, so adding feedback will have a effect on our input and output impedance. Right, other properties for negative feedback is it stabilizes our gain. So in the ideal case, we have infinite amount of gain available and applying the feedback, we can select our gain. Also, it increases our bandwidth or improves our frequency response. So with our feedback, the higher the gain, the lower our frequency response of our amplifier. So if we decrease the gain of our amplifier, our bandwidth will increase. So having control uh, with, uh, of our bandwidth with feedback can help us to select our amplifier bandwidth. We use it like a filter or prevent that we are using it as a filter in the wrong area. Also, our amplifier linear range is increased when applying feedback, which reduces noise and distortion. So, in our next video, we will have a look at 
when we apply negative feedback to one of our amplifiers and the different configurations that we can have and what the effect is when applying this feedback. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.